what is the goal of home church? And so we'll do a session uh, today and then another one on the, the third week of November. And then December, we'll have two home church trainings. And the theme for those trainings will be, what should I expect? What should I expect? And so for those of you who are new, uh, the rhythm that we're going to have here at Garden City Church is the first and third week of the month, you will be in home church. And that will be either at your actual home, or it could be on your college campus, or it could be in a conference room where you work. And then the second and fourth Sunday of every month, we will have a worship celebration. And that will be where we really press into preaching and teaching to the presence of God. On those second and fourth Sundays of the month, we gather together and we'll celebrate all of what God is doing uh, during that, that time. And so what we're doing to build up to that is home church training. That way you know what home church is, you know what to expect, and you're able to you know, really go into that confidently. After December's training sessions are over, we will take uh, the third Sunday in January, and by that time we will have our home church leaders, which many of you will be home church leaders. We will make those registrations available actually later this month. And for those of you who will be hosting Home Church, we will have a Sunday where we pray over you and we commission you and we believe God for all that he's going to do through your home church, wherever it is uh, throughout the city. And then starting in February, that will be the first month that we identify with that, that rhythm of the first and third week being Home Church and the second and fourth Sunday being our worship celebration. Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. So Pastor Seamus is here today, my good friend, and today's going to be a little different. We're going to kind of do an interview, and I, I asked him to just come and share from his heart as it relates to home church. And so first, I want you to introduce yourself and just talk about why home church is so important to you and some of the experiences you've had with it. Yeah. Uh, well, greetings, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Seamus Strap. Uh, first off, my wife is in the back. She's amazing. I love her so much. Uh, I have two children. I have Shepherd and Salem. They are like 13 months apart, 12 and a half months apart. Uh, so life is, you know, we're, we're dealing with diapers and, and food on the floor everywhere. And if you know that life, uh, say amen, somebody. Amen. Uh, so uh, currently right now, I work for Cover My Meds. Anybody in the Cover My Meds building right now? No, there's two other people that work there. So Amen. Uh, so I, I currently work there, but before that, I was uh, the pastor for two years at Stowe Church on the south side of Columbus, uh, Parsons Avenue, anybody know Parsons Avenue, Children's Hospital, uh, right behind uh, the west side. Uh, the south side is, is what the city of Columbus, the government of Columbus, has defined as an under-resourced area. Uh, that area, 43206, has... Uh, the third highest uh, infant mortality rate of black children in America. Uh, that was according to a couple years ago. The overall birth rate, uh, the, the, the rating that they give uh, for the birthing experience for women in that area is a D, right? So we can also, I can spit out uh, hundreds of, of uh, statistics of the drug rate, of the poverty rate, uh, of the brokenness. It's, but you know that, right? We, you, you'd have to be blind if you drive down Parsons Avenue. So we were there. My wife and I were there. We were planning a church inside of Stowe Mission. Stowe Mission has uh, a dental clinic, an eye clinic, a pregnancy resource center. There's a food pantry. There's a meal served Monday through Friday. And so our job was to come along and to uh, plant a church there. It was a Christian organization. And, and the, the idea was that the church is kind of the trunk of the tree. That we could, we could serve as many people as we want, but if the gospel is being preached, we're really not doing much. We're kind of helping the temporal, but we're not helping the eternal. So my wife and I did that, and we planted the church through uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, right? Uh, so I went through all the trainings that you would need to go through to be a Southern Baptist church, church planter, right? And I went through cohorts, and I went down to Atlanta, and I went to the headquarters, and I read the books, and I did all this stuff. Um, but I was kind of in a unique situation where I was the only church planter in my cohort, really within my kind of uh, peer group that was serving in an area like I was serving. 
The majority of this great book, uh, you should pick it up uh, by Les McConnell called Church in Hard Places. And the, the cover alone is a great uh, visual because there's one little uh, red pin in the middle of the city. And all the other red pins that symbolize the churches are on the outskirts, right? We love to plant churches on the outer belt. We don't like to plant churches in the middle, right? Because that's where the scary people are, right? And I'm not talking... It just Here's the... Yeah, I don't want to go anywhere. I don't want to go down some bad place. We're afraid of scary people. And if we're honest with ourselves... Poor people scare us. Mm. If I could pick ten, if I, you gave me your ten top, you know, MySpace friends. MySpace. Come on, you remember? <laughs> Maybe I'll use that. I don't know what you use. If I look at your ten top MySpace friends, I bet you that they are in the same socioeconomic grouping that you are. You might have one friend that makes, you know, six figures, or maybe, maybe you make six figures and I need to be friends with you. But maybe you're making, you know, boo boo cash, you know, a friend. But I can promise you that for the most part, you do not have a friend. Or the majority of your friends, I should say, are not on food stamps, Section 8 housing. Or maybe that's you. Maybe you are in that. And you, that is your friend group. Because, But if you live in that group, you do not have it. So the reason that I know this is true is because in German Village is on one side of Parsons Avenue. And Southern Orchard is on the other side. And there is a stark difference between this neighborhood. There are multi-million dollar homes here. And up until a couple years ago, the neighborhood is getting gentrified. I'm taking too much, too long. It's, 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 I could have I bought an $8,000 home five years ago, wow. right? Our neighbor, the west side is the same, same thing. I go to certain areas. Really, I, I kind of hang. If I go... Uh, was that east of Hay, and then I go west of Hay. West of Hay is going to be the closer you get to uh, Westgate Park, yeah. the nicer, the cleaner, the better, right? And I don't mean that on a worth salvific worth better. I just mean to the human eye. Yeah. Come on, somebody. Yeah. There's a reason for this, right? Because it's a spiritual principality that wants to separate us and make us think that the most important difference. Right is our money difference. Now, so my wife and I, we planted a church in that area, and the, I was the only guy that planted a church in that type of community. And my questions were a lot different than their questions. Their questions were, how do we make a service nice enough on Easter there where we can get, you know, a thousand people? My question was, what do you do when someone dies of heroin from your community? What do you do when someone that you've been discipling goes off the wagon and is all a meth and shows up at your doorstep and wants you to fix their problem. I didn't know. Come on. Right? It was an area where I was so out of my comfort zone. But that I knew that that's what God had me to be. So my family, my mom grew up on Bins Avenue. If you know where Bins Avenue. She grew up the first house from Briggs and Bins. She grew up there in a big Irish Catholic family. That community over there used to be a white Catholic Irish kind of community. And so she lived there. My mom then moved to Section 8 housing down on in Grove City, not a, right across from, from Urban Crest. And so I grew up right across at that community. So my, my experience was poverty, right? I had free lunch. I had pay less shoes. I, my father wasn't in the picture, right? And so I had more in common with my black brothers and sisters, then my white brothers and sisters at Grove City, who mom and dad were there, and they shopped at Abercrombie and Fitch, and I just, that was a world that I just didn't know. So God had always put in my heart, I'm gonna, God, when I came to Christ when, at 17 years old, I was gonna, God gave me a heart for the homeless person, for the drug addict, for the, for the least of these, right? We're gonna talk, you know, when we're talking about Jesus uh, serving the, the people in prison, serving the people that are hungry, come on, somebody. So, we did that, and I had everything handed to me that you would want in the suburban church world. I had all the books, all the resources. I had all the backing. I had all the support. And me and my leadership team, I had an amazing leadership team. Shout out to Jess Griffin. Shout out to uh, Andy here. We had everything handed to us that would make for a successful church in the suburban world. But the issue was I didn't have, we didn't have the problems that suburbanites had. Right? The suburban, and I'm, and I'm not trying to preach it to you. I'm not trying to make you feel bad if this is, if you live in, you know, Dublin, right? But the answers and what you're searching for there is a lot different than what you're trying to answer in a neighborhood 
Mount Sullivan in the hilltop. Come on. So, uh, our church team, as we were praying and just trying to figure out, what well, God, what do you want to do with this community? We began to think, realize that the trappings of normal church were just that kind of trappings. That we do these things. Gerald and I were laughing about this. We put fog machines in churches thinking that that's going to awake the Holy Ghost. Right? That as soon as... But if you... In, the, in all reality, like let's not, let's not try to make people who use them not to be but bad. But, but if you just look at them things, we go, what is that about? It's kind of goofy. So what we did is we had a, we had a, we had a, a, a service of... Uh, a series of sermons called "What Is Church?" and I took away the I took away the stage, I took away the lightings, I took away the microphone, I put people in folded chairs around the music stand, and we preached on "What are we here for? What is the church?" And we kind of realized, man, you can do church, meaning God's work of salvation and redemption on earth, with all all that stuff, right? As much as the books and the people would try to convince you that that's not the case, you can do it. Yeah. And so we. Uh, that began to be just a kind of a tension between the people who ran the mission because we were kind of going, we might start heading to, and we read books that were kind of moving our hearts, but we were going to start moving to living rooms and that kind of caused a, a difference in opinions between them and us. So we eventually said, well, we're going to do our own thing. We're going to do it in a house. Uh, and so we began to have church in a home. And we would we would sing and we would have a, we'd have sermons and we worship and we take communion every weekend. We tried to go to Acts 2 and say, what did they do? It says that they listened to the apostles' teachings, they prayed, they shared a meal together, and they were in fellowship. Let's just do those four things. What if we did those four things and we just believe what the Bible says that you should do? Like, weird, right? And so uh, then, we had a, we had a, then we had a first baby, then we had a second baby, and then the corona came. And it was like, Lord, what are we doing? Like, it, so a lot came upon us. So we just kind of said, hey, Lord, let's, we're going to dissolve this house church. And we're going we're gonna to heal. My wife and I, we, have, we need the time to heal. We need the time to rest. Uh, it's a Sabbath. And so I think, I was talking about, I think God did it in the time that he did it. Because if then Gerald, who was a friend of mine before, during all that kind of stuff, if he said, hey, I'm doing this really cool house church thing. I probably would have in the back of my mind going, I wish I could be a part of it. But I couldn't, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, it, long story short, I came to Christ when I was 17, I got married at 27, and here I am. Does that answer your question? Does that answer it? Praise God. All right. Praise God. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I love it. And so when you, when you think about that, like, Because it's our experience, right? We just have experienced guy in front, sit in pew, listen, read, do, go home. And that's a very, you know, we, we did, we, that started because that's what the rabbis were doing in the synagogues. And then the church came along and the Catholic church said, this is what's going to happen. You're going to come and you're going to sit down and you're going to go home, right? And so, but as Gerald had spoken of in the past, in the world where church is illegal, there's no public worship. You can't have a space like this. So you have to go to the living room and it's secret. And I think the benefit of that is twofold. And then we'll kind of go into what the goal. I think the benefits are two. First, when it's smaller groups coming together, we then have the ability to be flexible and respond to the immediate needs in our specific community. And what I mean by that is my neighborhood on the south side on Champion Avenue is a lot different than wherever you live. So if you're having church at your address, your immediate neighbors have a different desire, and I, what I mean by that is a, is a heart desire, than my community does. And so the way that Jesus meets those specific desires is very different, right? If I'm in Hilliard and I live in, you know, next to Hill Road, Hilliard Rome Road, 
what the gospel says to that person is going to be different than when the person is on Champion Avenue. So I think that then those specific house churches have the ability to respond. What does our immediate group, but if we all come from a large spattering all across, and we think that we're going to be able to answer with one thing, I, it's just, it's unbelievable, or it's unrealistic, I should say. But when we can go as like little units as an army, right, and, and our unit is to this part of the battlefield, and your unit is to this part of the battlefield, and your unit needs to address sexual uh, tra sex trafficking, well, my unit needs to address a different thing. Mm -hmm. And so we have the ability to do that. So that's the first benefit, is being able to be specific in our ministry. ministry. And then I think number two, I think the benefit of the house church is it it spreads evenly the priesthood of the believer. Mm -hmm. Go to go to, you know go to the Old Testament, right? There were priests, but God said of Israel, "You're all priests. You're all ministers to the world to bring people to Yahweh." So if you meet the foreigner, you meet someone from Assyria, you meet someone from Moab, you're all going to bring them to Yahweh. Peter comes along and he picks that up and he says in 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, we're all believers. We're all believers and then we're all priests offering sacrifice. And what we've done in, in our modern church, when the one guy is up here, he's our priest. And he'll evangelize for us and he'll pray for us and he'll do the work for us. Rather than, no, you all are priests. Amen, somebody. It's really good. The gift of Jesus is priesthood of all believers. Come on. You now. Yeah. Come on, give me some notes. Come on, somebody. Because I know some of your note takers. Exodus 19, 6. 1 Peter 2 and 9. And Revelation 5, verses 8 through 10. He knows the street addresses. Come on. Exodus 19, 6. 1 Peter 2 and 9. Revelation 5, 8 through 10. These are the three areas that you can look and see exactly what Seamus is talking about, that we have all been called to be the kingdom of priests unto the Lord. Peter calls us the royal priesthood, and then John the Revelator, he gets, he gets the full picture that we will be kings and priests forever who will rule and reign with Jesus Christ. And so what I hear Pastor Seamus saying is that the home church expression a part of the goal of home church is for God to get what he originally intended. That the home church expression is, is conducive for seeing the whole priesthood activated, equipped, and put in position to respond to that call, to that vocation, to be his kingdom of priests in the earth, specifically where he's given us influence. Our homes, our jobs, our college campuses, etc. That's it. And, and when it's one guy who knows it all, and there's one fountainhead of knowledge and uh, uh, evangelism and power. That, that doesn't give your neighbor who needs to hear the gospel much of a chance. Because if they've been hurt by church, and if church is scary, and church is weird. Like we've made it this, there's nothing like it really in our culture. But a, but a couch and a living room and people singing and having a bonfire and a party. and These are all cultural expressions that everybody has. And if and if priesthood is could be as easy as I'm having a bonfire, brother, come over and roast a hot dog. Mm -hmm. Then it has the chance for them to look around and go, Christians are pretty neat, right? Like they're not the hypocrites we thought they were. They're not and because if, if we all we all are the priests and not the one guy being the priest, it makes the ability to share the gospel and make the conquering of the world Tell you somebody. Okay, anyway, I don't want to go too far on what I want to talk about. So those are the two biggest benefits. And so we're, Gerald, kind of, we were talking about, we were jiving. I think that there are, there are two ways to view this. What, what is the goal of house church? I think there's a goal that, that God has for himself, and I think there's a goal that God has for humans. And, the, and to break that even further, when it comes to the human parts, there's a goal that God has for the the universal church, and then there's the, the goal that God has for the believers. So kind of like we were saying, there's a threefold goal. One is specifically for God and his glory. The other two are part of that, but more, of, more pertaining to what humans are doing to participate in that. Does that make That's sense? Good. That's good. So here's the, here's the reality. What is a goal? 
we have to start there. It sounds so elementary. It sounds so silly. I love Jeremiah 29 11, right? People argue that it's, it's so taken out of context. But I believe it, it's, it's easy to just take it for, at face value. It, God says that, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and hope, right? Now, he's speaking to specifically to those Jews who are in exile. He's saying you're going to be there for seven years. That's great. But I think that God has a plan for us as well, right? Like there's not just... There's not just a hope for them, but there's a hope for us. And the King James says it this way at the end of verse 11, that God has an expected end. There's an end in sight. What is the goal of the target? When God is shooting his arrow called the church, where does he want that thing to land? And I think that, that all, the way to, to describe that, the way the Bible would describe that is maturity. God wants maturity, or as Jesus would use the word perfect on the Sermon on the Mount, he doesn't mean morally imperfect. What he means is complete whole people. We as humans are shattered, and he's trying to bring us back to wholeness. I think God is aiming for maturity for us, and the, the easiest way that the Bible describes that maturity is fruitfulness. Yes. God wants you to bear fruit, and we're going we're gonna to kind of tap into that, uh, about what that fruit looks like for the individual, for the church. Like that. Am so, I being clear? That's so good. You know, when you when you think about maturity and fruitfulness for the believer, what are some of those things that that you identify as a pastor? Yeah. So once again, it's let's delineate. There's there's a goal for the church, and there's a goal for the Christian. And I have to stress this point because in America, we've kind of magnified the individual. And we belittled the whole. First Corinthians 12, right? We are a body. We are the body of Christ. And we're all parts. And what we do is we make the hand really important. And we belittle the other parts. And that's just, the, that's anti-gospel. It's anti antithetical to the gospel. And so what we have to recognize is that the church is the supreme vehicle for God's redemption. It is not your individual life. You get to be a part of it. It's a gift of your salvation. But the church will always be forever more important than your individual life. And we should worship at that fact, right? Because God is using something bigger. It's multi-generational. It's multi-diversity. It's, you know, multi-racial. It's multilingual. It's multi, you know, it's throughout all generations. It's throughout all time. God is doing something big and humongous, and that is the church. And by God's grace, I get to be a small little skin cell in that piece or whatever part of the body that God wants to be, be a part of. So here's, here's, here's how I want to delineate. There's, there's a fruit that, that, that God wants the church to bear. Let's talk about that. I, I, I kind of divide it up, and I have some, some notes that I'm going to give to Gerald that he can put up on the internet because I just, I just wrote some stuff out that might be helpful for later. I would, I would say that there are two types of fruits. I'm going to keep you going layer and layer and layer, and hopefully you can read these notes and it makes sense later. For the church, there's an internal and there's external fruits that should be bare. We look through the Bible. We're gonna, there are things that we need to get right amongst us, and then there's, the, there's things that outside the church, people need to look at us and view. So internal, what are some of the major things that we need to do? Unity. This is our issue, right? Jesus says in, in, in John when he's praying that he goes, I want you to be unified. I want you to love one another. And what does the world look at us the most and they pick apart? That we're, that we're broken apart, right? That there's so many denominations. There's so many opinions that we talk about about the Baptists and the Baptists talk about about the Methodists and the Presbyterians. You know, they, people don't even know what a Presbyterian is. <laughs> and so there needs to be unity. Uh, let me just run through these because I don't want to take too long. But impartiality uh, is a fruit of the inside, right? We shouldn't look at the rich and the poor or the black and the white. There needs to be impartiality. We need to look at each other and go, there's something inside of you that's more valuable than anything that you're going to reveal to me on the outside. Your clothing, whatever. Now, those things on the outside can be valuable. Those things can be important. The language you speak, the color of your skin, the culture you come from are valuable and beautiful in the eyes of God. But we can't use those to trump other believers. That's good. Come on. And we shouldn't disregard, no, you come from a different type of culture than I have, so don't even think about the culture, right? That's what we do. 
But God is saying impartiality. Everybody gets a seat at the table. And that's why the kitchen, that's why the table and eating a meal together is so great. Everybody's equal at the dinner table. Right? Everybody's equal. You're all invited. Nobody is set apart. There's no preacher and layman. There's no this guy and that guy. We're all equal eating our food. We talked about that in our session with what does the Bible say about home church in the New Testament? And we see repeatedly Jesus inviting the disciples to the table. We see him sitting at the table with sinners and tax collectors. We see him in the house of Pharisees at their table. And there's something so powerful about table fellowship that the Lord is wanting to restore. And home church allows us to do that. Where it makes more sense for your unsaved neighbor, your unsaved coworker, your unsaved you know classmate to experience Jesus around your kitchen table in your living room before they even come to a corporate gathering like this. And we're at the table of the Lord. You begin to break bread with them and share your testimony and begin to testify of God's goodness in your life. And they can ask questions and, and, and you can unpack that and you can read the scripture with them and you can teach them how to read the scripture alongside of you. You can pray with them and you can teach them how to pray alongside of you right there in, in your home. And so table fellowship is, is so significant. One of the verses that we ended with in that session was Revelation 3.20, where Jesus says he stands at the door and he knocks, and anyone who hears and opens, he will invite to dine with him. And we make that reality as we allow our homes to become sanctuaries, allow our homes to become the catalyst for encounter with the revelation knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so we really want to see that as a, as a prominent part of, of this home church expression. The, con Hello. the consummation of the gospel, right, of the kingdom coming to earth, what God, when he comes down, we're, there's a meal first, right, the meal of the lamb. We come together, and the, one of the first things that we're going to do in the new kingdom is just feast. Come on. It's just eat with, and I, there's something, every human being eats. Every human being eats, and that's what people just want to talk about food, and they want to taste yummy things. Ecclesiastes are like, eat, drink, and be merry, right? I think there is something that God wants to do with that. So, okay, let's, let's just kind of bulletproof some of this stuff. The internal fruit should be some unity, impartiality, equipping of the saints, which is learning how to interpret the Bible, spiritual gifts, faith, evangelism, training, conflict management. We're going to talk about that later. Worship, thanksgiving, the sacraments, baptism, and communion. These are fruits of of the internal body, right? These should be, should be things that God has given us that we get to enjoy amongst ourselves. Say those again a little slower. <laughs> Baptism and communion are a gift, right? We think they're just kind of a ceremony that you just do because they're, they're this weird, far, ancient thing. But if you look at their, really, communion, and when you look at it at 1 Corinthians, it started with a meal. Yes. It, it wasn't just simply, let's break a cracker, let's drink some juice. It was, you eat together, and what were they doing? They were eating too quick and drink, getting drunk too fast before the, the poor people came. And Paul says, no, 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 no. This, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna infect the table, right? You're going to make the table unholy. And so communion with Christ cannot be taken away from communion with the body. That's so good. You cannot commune with your heavenly father and not commune with the, the, our earthly brothers and sisters. And we want to say, well, well, I'll just go to church to just hear a word and then I'll go home and I'll never experience. That is the most unbiblical thing you can do. To experience Christ is to experience his people in all their messiness, in all their ugliness, and all their shades of, of brokenness, right? So, we have to learn how to get through this thing together. It's not going to work by Seamus alone. And I'll, we're going to talk about that here in a second. So, so there's internal fruits. The external fruits, what should the world see? They should see unity, justice. They should experience our evangelism. They should see we should be serving the least of these. And then we should be displaying the kingdom or the power of the kingdom, which should be you know, prophecy, healing, those miraculous things. Those are, those are part of the gospel that we can display to the outside world. Uh, 
that he is God, right? Who else can heal? Who else can speak things that are not, right? Reveal this. this they said that to Saul that they prophesied his heart. So mm. those are kind of the, the, it's the church. That's what the church should be bearing. Is that, is that clear? Is that any questions? Good. Any yeah. questions from you all? Yeah. Any, any questions? Is it, am I making sense? Are you following me on my journey? Does that, are you digging it? Come on. Thank you for the thumbs up. <laughs> so one of the things that we really want the framework of this to be is the three C's that, that Garden City Church is, is really rooted in. And that's communion with the Lord, experiencing perpetual fellowship, intimacy with Jesus, and the community with each other, and believing that as those two things are being experienced, everything necessary for the cultivation of our city, the cultivation of our neighborhoods, is, is made available. The cultivation is the preparation of cities, the preparation of neighborhoods, the preparation of the earth for the return of the Lord. It's the prep cultivating, it's preparing hearts and preparing the actual neighborhoods that God has positioned us in to identify with the coming kingdom and the coming king because we're actually revealing and making him known, making his kingdom known in the here and the now. So I'll say that again. Communion with the Lord, community with each other, and from that, identifying with the, the reality and the invitation to cultivate the earth for the return of the Lord and his kingdom. And we believe in home church that those things are going to be best expressed as believers are coming together around the name, the beauty, the worth, the majesty, the glory of Jesus, prayer, his word, communion, at the table together, and then you begin to identify, okay, what are the needs of my neighborhood? What are the things that he's inviting us to engage in to bring hope and healing and to bring the kingdom of God right where he's given us influence? You know, as, as Seamus was talking about recognizing that, that the gospel is inviting us to no longer just identify with an individualism, but to realize that we, through Christ, have actually been baptized into a body. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about this. We've been baptized into the body of Christ. What's so significant about that? Well, we see that family is eternal. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Where harmony and love and respect, where mutual submission, where mutual honor is expressed within the Godhead, within the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when we're saved, we are restored back into this familiar dynamic that is healthy, that is pure, that is holy, that is righteous. And then we get to make that known as the body of Christ in the earth. And so where two or three are gathered, Jesus himself is made present. He is made known. He is manifest in the midst. And what does that look like in houses? What does that look like? at your job? What does that look like at college campuses? Well, it looks like people being able to see for themselves, oh, this is, this is the family of God. This is what the gospel has invited us to step back into. And it's one of the most powerful and one of the most supernatural dynamics of not only evangelism, but ultimately making real what Jesus' blood and resurrection has given us access to. God wants family. Yes. God wants family. He wouldn't have created us. He wouldn't create even the spiritual beings in the world, which I'm going to talk about in a second. He wants you to be a part of his family, or he would never would have created us, right? That's the purpose of it. And here's, before the fall, God's family was created through procreation. Before the fall, God would have just had humans being a part of his family through procreation. Come on, somebody. The fall comes. Now, as human beings procreate, we are just not naturally brought into his family. Something has to be done. Something had to, to intervene for you to be brought back into, adopted back into the family. That's Jesus. Jesus comes. Now, how is God's family grown up? The Great Commission. It went from procreation to the Great Commission. God has said, Jesus says, the fields are plentiful for harvest, but the workers are few. The workers are few. Pray for laborers to yes. go into your father's work. And so that's what house church is. It's us getting together and saying, we are the laborers. You go to your neighborhood, 
the majority of your neighbors are not going to know Jesus, or they're not going to know the biblical Jesus. And that's an important distinction. Your neighbors might say, yeah, I'm a Christian. But they're not bearing the fruit of Christianity, which we'll talk about the individual Christians. So we, we're, we're, we're family makers. The gospel is inviting people, come back to dad. Come back to the father. You've been estranged. You've been away. You've been hurt. Come back to dad. He loves you. And our big brother, or Hebrews chapter 2, our big brother did everything that needed to be done. In order to make that happen. So the fruit of the individual Christian. It's important, right? We as individual Christians are to bear fruit that builds up into the bigger. And it starts with a private, it starts with your private life that has to be built up that will then grow out and, and show into your public life. So kind of to, to explain that, if we're not having time in the word and in prayer, we can never expect to show the character of God. You're never going to know the character of God outside of his revealed word and his fresh breath of the Holy Spirit blowing on that revealed word. You'll never know. Tell me who Jesus is without the Bible. You can't do it. You can tell me who a historical man is, but you cannot tell me who the Son of God is. And that's very important, right? So we have to experience this private life of knowing God's word, effectual prayer life, hope, Generosity, Hebrews chapter 6, generosity should be in private. You know, come we should just blow trumpets and say how great we are. Christ dependency, spiritual practices of Sabbath, journaling, solitude, silence. These are all kind of private things that we get to experience. And then those go out into the what the public will see, what our neighbors will see, what our coworkers will see of the spiritual fruit. They'll go, that dude is always kind. No matter how mean people are to him, he is always kind. He is loving. He is faithful. He is steadfast. He is gentle. Gentle is such a God. So, so love, faith, embodying the Christian morality, sanctification, right? We as Christians are to be holy as he is holy, 1 Peter chapter 1. Right? So these are all fruits to be bare, things to be shown. These are the goals. These are the goals of being here. If you're just here because you want to be a good person, it's way better than that. If you want to be here because you want to be you moral, it's way better than that. It's way better than just stop looking at dirty pictures. Stop lying. Stop gossiping. Those things will come. Those things are real. Those things are fruit. But there's a revealed gospel that is way better than God just trying to control if you're a good person or you're a bad person. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so that all that leads into what, what God is looking for is a mature people. People who, who don't just come to believe, right? What we've done far too long in the model of church where there's a guy up front and you sit in the pew is we bring you to Christ, we convert you, and that's good enough. Mm. We said, that's good enough. You're just not going to hell. Amen, so which is great. First, that Colossians chapter 1 says that you've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son. That you've been forgiven of your sins. But here's something that I want us to, to kind of chew on. Paul, Paul is speaking uh, to the Colossians, right? Uh, and he says in, let me sure I get it. Go to Colossians 1, 27, 28, 29. Mm -hmm. Colossians 1, I have it somewhere in here, but... I didn't highlight it like I should have. <clears throat> to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Yeah. Paul's biggest desire was that the people he was preaching to would be mature. Yeah. And he says it over and over again. He says it later in Colossians. He goes, I don't want you to be tossed around yeah. by human doctrine, by elemental spirit. I want you to be mature people. Psalm 1. 
Blessed is the man who meditates on the word of God. He's a, he's a tree planted by the water, bearing its fruit. Its leaves do not wither. Come on. This, in the Jeremiah 17, Jeremiah picks that up. He says, we're not going to be desert bushes blown around. We're going to be trees of light that people could pull off and go, we want justice. Isn't the world calling for justice? And they would see in the church what justice is. They would take off the fruit. They would eat of it and say, ooh, that is so good. Revelation says that there's going to be a tree, you know, trees lining a river that leaves from his temple. And its leaves are going to be for the healing, that its fruit is going to be right. We should be bearing that fruit. And the world should see this. And go, God is true. Yes. Jesus is the Son of God. Yes. But we don't hit that. We're petty. Mm. We are petty. We malign people. John says in 1 John, he says, you talk bad about your brother. You praise God, but then you spit venom at your wife, your sister, your brother, your friend, your coworker. Foolishness. We should, this, these are elemental things, man. And so this isn't to put shame on us. This is to see what the gospel truly is and to rejoice in it, right? Good believing leads to good action. Right believing leads to right action. And so what is the, 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 the goal that God has for the humans in the church and in the individual is to, is to be attractive truths. It's to bear fruit, to be loving, to be kind. Really, just the simple things that the gospel teaches. Mm -hmm. Treat others as you ought to be treated. Mm -hmm. But here's where it gets awesome. Here's where the gospel is so much bigger than what we as Americans kind of just take for granted. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. That is good. But it's more than that. Right? It's more than just let's deal with you doing bad things. Right, let's, let's go to Ephesians. Let's talk about what, what is God's goal for himself? What is he looking for in giving glory and honor to himself? Right, God wants all the glory. He wants all the honor. He wants all the dominion. He wants all the power and the praise. And so let's, let's talk about that. Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to go verses 3 on down to about 13. If you have your Bible, feel free to open it up. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ, uh, prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard the administration of God's grace, which has, was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote briefly, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to mankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. Let's really focus in on this. To me, this the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles, the unfathomable, that's not the right word, fathomable riches of Christ. And to enlighten all people as to what is the plan of the mystery is, which, of, which for the ages has been hidden in God who created all things. So that the multifaceted wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was accordance to the eternal purpose which God carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confidence, confident access through faith in Him. Therefore, I ask you not to become discouraged about my tribulation in your behalf, uh, in your behalf, since uh, they are your glory. Joe, do you mind if I talk to the people for a minute? Can I have your microphone? So, here's the thing. I want you to go, pull out your phone. Pull out your phone right now. Pull out your phone. Go, go to AxGeeve.com. And I want you to look up a raw diamond. Come on, somebody. Just do this. Look up a raw diamond picture. Pull it out. Has anybody seen what a raw diamond just pulled out of the earth looks like? No? Some people, yes. Pull it out. Look at it. I'm not kidding. Look at your phone. What you're going to see is a cloudy, dirty rock. Like, that's it. 
If you pulled out out of the earth anything interesting, you'd hope that it would be beautiful right away. But here's the thing. It's just cloudy and dirty off the bat. But then you turn around and you give it to your girlfriend, and for some reason she's going to be committed for the rest of your life. But it's not what you just pulled out of the earth, is it? It's something beautiful. It's something splendid. What makes a diamond beautiful? What makes it splendid? It's cuts. A diamond has 52 facets. I Googled that. I'm not that smart. 52 facets. And the point of it is that it would be able to catch light correctly. That you would see the clarity, the beauty of it. Diamonds just don't pop out and say, hello, here I am. Put me on a ring. It has to be revealed. It has to be taken by a master craftsman and shown to be made beautiful. Come on, somebody. She's going to preach it for me. She knows where I'm going. So here's the thing. Paul says, he says, the gift that I was given was to preach the gospel. He counts it as a gift to declare the goodness of God. He didn't just take it for granted. He said, this is a grace given to me that I get to preach to you Gentiles. He's not preaching to the Jews. He's preaching to the Gentiles. He's preaching to you and me, right? Unless you're a Jewish brother, and then shalom. Come on, somebody. So here's the thing. So he said, the gift of God to me is that I get to preach the gospel. And the gospel is an unfathomable treasure of riches poured out on God, or poured out on humans. That there are riches poured out. Jesus was saying, Jesus says to us, he goes, you Gentiles, you worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. So Jesus isn't concerned about making you temporally rich. He's worried about a spiritual inheritance given to you to make sure that you can be a part of the family of God. The biggest treasure is that human beings get to be a part of the family of God. It was a treasure that was lost at Genesis 3. And so the good news is that human beings who are impoverished, who are poor in spirit, who are peasants, our king comes down in all of his riches, in all of his glory. He bends down and he says, you get to be a part of the family. You get riches in heavenly places. He says in Ephesians chapter 1 that you are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. There's not one thing that God withholds from you in heaven. How good. I, I mean, it, we, we look at us, man, and we're wretched. But God in his treasures, in his goodness, looks at us and says, you can be a part of this. Thank you, Jesus. He says, that's my treasure. That's my gift is that I get to give this to you. But let's dig deeper. He says, it's not just to preach. He says, to enlighten you. To take you out of darkness. To bring you into light. Right? Jesus says in John chapter 3, he says that we hated darkness. And then he comes and he brings us into light. And anybody who loves light loves what is true, right? So we come into the light of the gospel. We're no longer in dark. We're no longer out of Eden, kicked out. But we are shed light. We're brought back into the promised land, Right? We're waiting on it at least. He says, you are enlightened to what? A mystery. There's a mystery hidden for ages. What are you talking about, brother? Let's talk to the Gentiles in the room. Throughout human history, we've all been searching. Every culture and every place is searching for God. And here's the truth. Atheism is Atheism is, is man in his science and all his knowledge gathering things up. No one is born an atheist because you, we go to the remote jungles. Nobody doesn't believe in some sort of supernatural power. The human heart left to its own devices will believe that there's something more than my physical eyes can see. Amen? Things that go bump in the night, tarot cards. That's why we read the book The Secret because we're like, there's got to be something more than this. Come on. And so we worshiped Hercules and we worshiped Odin and we worshiped these other gods because we knew that there was something more. And the Bible would say that he put eternity in the hearts of man. There's something in you that begs for more. There's something that's in you that says, I got to know more than what I see. 
And women, I talk to my wife about this all the time. Women are more intuitive. They kind of know this. Men are kind of logical and uh, just hard-headed probably. Women can kind of sense this. And that's why we see more church women kind of in church because they're just not as stubborn as men are. But we worshiped other gods. And what is what is uh, Paul says is in Acts chapter 16, he's preaching to the Athenians. He says he places you in, per in different places in different regions. He says so that you might grope and find him. We're all searching. There's a mystery to be solved here. Why does our heart ache for more? Why is death so sad? If I was just, if this was just life from a big bang, I would look at death and I go, what else would you expect? But death hurts. Death isn't right. We shouldn't die. It's not right. And at your heart, you're saying, because there's something more. There's an eternalness to you. And the Gentile is lost. We don't know what we're looking for. But the Jew, the Jew gets Yahweh's covenant. Right, yeah. Yahweh comes, says, I want to rescue you. Let's do this thing. And he reveals himself to Moses. And he reveals himself to the law and the prophets. But here's the thing. The Jews had a mystery as well. There was no place in, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, in one chapter where it's going to plainly say to you, there's going to be God coming down to earth. He's going to be wrapped himself in flesh. He's going to die of a virgin birth. He's going to be sinless. He's going to die on a cross for you. He's going to take away your sins. He's going to resurrect on the third day. He's going to conquer, and then he's going to ascend and put your spirit in you. There's no one chapter. You're not going to find that in Genesis chapter 51. So chapter, Genesis chapter 51. But there's breadcrumbs. Genesis chapter 3 says to Eve, he goes through your seed, there's going to be someone that crushes the serpent's head. He says to Abraham in 12 and 15, he says, Through your family, all the nations will be blessed. The covenant will come back. He says to Judah in chapter 50, he says, Through your family is going to be the person who holds the scepter. The Messiah is going to come. He says to David in, in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, 15. Just come on, somebody, help me out. He says, Through your, your son will rule and reign forever. So the Messiah is going to come through David. Yes. And there's these breadcrumbs. There's this, all these things that point and lead to the point where you get to Jesus and the mystery is revealed that God is going to come for you. God is going to bring back the family. And here's where I want to... This is the mystery of the gospel. I wrote this down. He says, we, the, the mystery comes through Jesus and we had no clue that God would wrap himself in flesh come to declare his glory to rebellious men, die on, on their behalf, receive on himself full judgment, swallow death to the dregs, raise on the third day, crush the serpent's head, embarrass the powers of darkness, ascend to the right hand where he prays for us continually, turn our hearts to stone, to hearts of flesh, and move his presence from stone temples to hearts of flesh. That's the mystery of the gospel. And here's the thing. Paul, going back to what he's saying, he says he's, he gets to preach this gospel, this mystery that nobody knew of. Gentiles didn't know it. Jews didn't know it. And now he gets to share these riches for all people. But here's what he says. For what purpose? Why? Why this mystery? Why do it that way? What's going on here? He says, so that the multifaceted wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So that the multifaceted wisdom of God, the wisdom of God, like a diamond hidden in the earth, which is revealed through one cut, and then another cut, and then this covenant through Abraham, and then, then this covenant through Moses, and then through this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 3, and then through this prophecy, right? The slow but sure, God, surely God is going to reveal His wisdom to the world, but more specifically to the heavenly authorities and power. And here's where the gospel and bearing fruit gets so important. God wants to use the church as a pillar to hold up his multifaceted, splendorous wisdom to the world and embarrass the demonic forces and power. Come on. 
And when he was talking earlier, that text, right? Here's what we as Christians, we have to understand. There are spiritual powers that rule this earth. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are blinded to the mystery because the prince of the power of the air is blinding us. He's covering our eyes to the truth. And so the gospel comes through Jesus Christ, through the church, so that the church can lift up this wisdom so that the rebellious powers look at God and go, you are truly king. And we must bow down to you. And who is he using? The church. The church. The church. When we as the church bear fruit for justice and bear fruit of unity, it's an act of spiritual warfare. It's an act of holding up that God is good, that even though he's using us foolish people, us broken people, the powers that be are going to be maligned and pushed down. And we can talk about Daniel with the, 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 power, the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece. And we can talk about Paul says that he was wrestling against the beasts of Ephesus. And you go through all through the New Testament. Paul is obsessed with this. If you don't believe me, go read the, through Paul's letter. He's saying that the gospel is here not only to redeem us from sin. That's done though, right? We are redeemed from sin. We don't need to keep on sacrificing as Hebrews would say. Jesus died, sin is dealt with. Now is the time for us to mature, not move on, move on from the cross. Always preach him, him, preach Christ and him crucified. But because of that, now we get to be the revealers of the manifold wisdom of God to the powers that be. Amen. And so our acts of you know reading our Bible are acts of spiritual warfare. Mm. Our prayer is our acts of spiritual warfare. Our worship, our thanksgiving, the way that we love our neighbor is revealing to the powers that be that you are no longer in charge. That there's one king and he is in power and his throne, his enthronement was on the cross. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. And so this should move us. This should move us to stop fiddling around with silly things. Stop having arguments with people. Stop getting frustrated with your spouse over silly things. We got bigger things at hand here. And the world is waiting, as, as, as Romans would say, that the world is groaning for the sons of God to be revealed. And so that's the goal. Amen. That's the goal of house church. Come on, I'm going to bring it around. Yeah, yeah. Is that we would all be little shining lights. We'd be pillars holding up the multifaceted wisdom of God. That the spiritual powers in our, you know, on the south side, on the west side, on the north, wherever you at, so that those forces would recognize that they are no longer in charge of these things. They're no longer in charge of our culture. And that's why, here's the thing, we're, we as, as a western world, we've kind of lost faith in religion. But that's why we've picked up idolatry of political ideology. That's why when people, when you say something about, about someone's political ideology, they treat it as if it's their religion. I'm not trying to get political in here, but what I'm trying to say is those have roots in demonic forces in high places. Anything that would act against the kingdom and the will of God, those come from sources of powers that we just have no eye, eye to see. So we need to come with the gospel. We need to come with the wisdom to say that God revealed himself to the world and then through us. Thank you. Right? This is our act of spiritual warfare. This is, this is what we are, are called to do. And this is what the house church, I think, God is using uh, to, to, to do, to be that pillar Amen. for the multifaceted wisdom of God. Amen. Let's just turn our hearts to the Lord. I just feel that there's just a grace to uh, just to really come into agreement with God's desire. Lord, you... You are so incredible. Your ways, Lord. Your methods. Lord, what it is that, that you have established, what it is that you have redeemed, Lord, that your will may be accomplished in the earth. So God, as we talk about home church, Lord, we right now, we acknowledge, Lord, uh, that this is the wisdom of heaven, that you would put sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, Lord God, in these 
these positions all across the city in homes and jobs and schools and college campuses to reflect your manifold wisdom to principalities and powers to reveal Jesus as we come together around the name of Jesus, the hope of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ as we commune with you, as we partake in restored community with one another and believe, Lord God, for the cultivation of the earth for your return. So, Lord, we acknowledge, Lord, that in ourselves, Lord, we, we don't have what, what it takes, Lord. We don't have what it takes within ourselves, Lord Jesus, to see this plan unfold. But, Lord, as we lean on you, as we trust you, as we allow your spirit to guide us, Lord, our neighborhoods can be saved in the name of Jesus. Lord God, our neighbors can come to know you and to come to know your forgiveness, to come to know your hope. Father, we believe in the name of Jesus, Lord, that there's strategy, Lord, that there's solutions that you want to pour out, that there's blueprints that you want to give, Lord God, to see one street at a time, one, one local you know, job at a time come into the revelation knowledge of Jesus. And Lord, it's not going to happen because we only invite people to church, but we have to be the church outside of these walls. We have to be the hands and feet of of Jesus. You want to express your love through us wherever you've given us influence. And we believe that as we come together and we have to talk and pray and read the word and ask questions and worship you and take communion, Lord God, as we begin to par participate fully in all of what you've given, Lord, that we will come into that mature body that you desire us to be. But we will become those mature believers, those complete believers, because we in totality, step back into being the kingdom of priests that you called us to be. And Lord God, we believe that home church, Lord, is a method that you have given for such a time as this. And so, Lord, I just pray that there would be a continued unfolding, a continued revealing of your heart, that you would make known your desire, the goal that you have for this. And Lord, that we would agree with you and that we would position ourselves to respond. And Lord, that we would begin to contend. And that we would begin to prepare for what it is that you want to do in and through us. In living rooms, on couches, kitchen tables, conference rooms, college dorms all across this city. Lord, we thank you in advance. We thank you in advance. I thank you for what you've poured out through Seamus today. Thank you for his passion. Thank you for his conviction. Thank you, Lord, for his faith and belief that everything that Jesus paid for, that everything that Jesus made possible through the body of Christ, that we can actually see and experience. Have your way in us, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord.